In part 3 of Eastern Front Air Power, Air Marshal D.K. Patnaik, who was AOCNC Eastern Air Command from October 2021 to September 2022, assesses the EAC's capabilities and challenges. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amit Abrevi. Our guest today is Air Marshal D.K. Patnaik. He was Air Officer Commanding in Chief Eastern Air Command till September 30th, 2022. Air Marshal, thank you so much sir, for coming into our studios and giving us some time. Thank you, thank you, Amitabh, for calling. The Eastern Air Command, if you just want to get a sense of it, sir, it deals with five countries' borders. Now, that's a vast area. Mm -hmm. uh, five countries, like you said, uh, if you go back in time, there was something called East Pakistan, then, uh, of course, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar, and China. When East Pakistan was there, all these bases in Eastern Air Command had its own importance because we had to deal with uh, East Pakistan as such. But uh, consequent to the formation of Bangladesh, barring uh, uh, China, where our most of the focus is, we have a very, very friendly relation with all the other countries. And uh, so we would talk about one single adversary. Uh, not that we are overlooking anything that this country do keep monitoring. But not a major threat, but coming to our northern adversary, yes, uh, it is a uh, big ask. Right from uh, its initial days, uh, coming from 1962, it also happens to be the year when I was born. And it took 57 years after I was born to be heading that uh, Eastern Air Command, which is uh, mostly dealing with the uh, Chinese uh, adversary. Talking about that adversary, Air Marshal, I mean, how would you assess our strength and weaknesses, especially in that sector? If one were to assess, uh, uh, I'll take you back in time once again. I also happened to be a young pilot officer in uh, Tejpur way back in 1985. That time, the MiG-21s were operating. We had the MiG-8s, we had the Caribous, we had the Otters, and uh, the AN-32s had just uh, come at that time. These are the aircraft which were operating. Now what do we have? Uh, we have the Su-30, we have uh, also the Rafale, we have uh, other assets, whether it is air defense assets, we have sensors, we have very good helicopter assets also uh, in this area. What is important is uh, this chicken snake. Uh, all movements, mostly armament movement, which has to pass through that small chicken's leg, neck to come to the side of for the chickens. So it is very important that not only are we able to have our assets which can fly, but we should also have the ability to arm these assets, for which we, we need uh, places where you can store the arms. We also should be capable of loading up the arms and make it a potent weapon. So changes have happened from 1985, when I was uh, 2010, I was the Air One. That was the time when uh, the initiation of things had happened, of uh, making our command uh, more deterrent than what it was erstwhile. And I was very glad when I took over the Eastern Air Command. And my compliments to all the uh, personnel who have been there in Eastern Air Command. A lot of progress has been made, uh, and as we speak, we are in a position to give them a good deterrence. So that's how I see Eastern Air Command, very important command. And uh, things have improved and it is only improving as the days progress. In terms of challenges again in the area when, and all in the, the main bases, of course, at sea level, but then you're dealing with all tunes that go up to 18,000 feet. The difficulties in terrain, in altitude, in weather, in the topography, jungles. If you could just explain that to us, our viewers. Uh, to start with, uh, when the aircraft uh, were designed and developed, uh, nobody thought of uh, doing a warfare at uh, altitudes of uh, 18,000 feet plus. Cargill was the first time when uh, Indian Air Force 
used its uh, aerial assets on carrying out attacks over very high hill features. It had its own challenges. Having uh, flown the Kargil myself, uh, used to roll in for a dive at 45,000 feet and pull out of the dive by about 28,000 feet to avoid getting shot by the shoulder uh, fired uh, missiles. So, the aircraft when it is at 45,000 feet, the characteristics change. The engine performance goes down. The response of the engine is slack. And these are the things which the designers had never thought of when they made the aircraft as potent weapons. But here, the entire line of actual control, at least starting from Central Air Command, Lay, what have you, the altitudes, average altitude is 15,000 feet plus. So it, had its own, it has its own challenges. And the biggest challenge is launch base altitude. For which, as far as uh, we are concerned in India, most of the launch bases are at respectable levels wherein we can take off with the ma max all of weight. The same is not true for the Blaf airfield which have come up in the last 20, 15 years all along the line of actual control. They have the limitations. So that's an advantage which we have. We intend to uh, use it should the need arise. And if you could just elaborate on this last point that you're making to get our viewers to understand why this is a major advantage. It is a major advantage because if he has to use his aircraft uh, launching from uh, these bases which are at uh, excess of 15,000 feet and above, A, the takeoff roll is going to be longer, the all up weight that it can carry is going to be less, and weight of attack for those aircraft will be on the lesser side. Should he choose to use an airfield which is at a lower altitude, then that airfield is anything 400 to 500 kilometers more than from this uh, closer basis. So, to make an aircraft potent, it has to have its weapon. Unless good amount of weapon is not there, it's uh, not a good trade-off to use an aircraft. So, what probably they would use is surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Now, surface-to-surface -surface missiles over a, a period of time, uh, they have started getting to be more accurate. Moment a surface to surface missile becomes more accurate, then the threat perspective also changes. So instead of just an aircraft, you have to think about surface to surface, surface missile action also. That makes a difference in the way we think, way we have to respond. So that is what one of the major uh, points which we do discuss. We have our war games, we have our tabletop exercises. We give the best of the guys to behave like a enemy and they come out with this and we find answers. All of it may not be the way the enemy thinks, but at least we have uh, options available and make, we make use of these options to ensure that uh, we are rightly prepared to deter them well. Again, Amashal, picking up from this last point in terms of how prepared we are for our air defenses, they're both suggesting that again, one of the S-400 batteries is also placed in that area. Is that a huge, significant uh, air defense against the threats? A any air defense asset, <laughs> modern air defense asset, uh, can cause a lot of uh, planning problems to the adversary. For example, if, say, we were talking about the S-400, the enemy will start thinking much more carefully before it starts coming anywhere close. So though the uh, range is about 400, let's say 250, let's say 300. He has to take off before he comes. And for him to use that, he has to come closer than 300 to be effective. So it's a major deterrent and uh, it, it is good for planners to ensure that a combination of uh, surface to air missiles, aircraft are available to take the enemy on should they decide to come anywhere close. You talked about the advantages we have in terms of uh, takeoff from sea, um, near sea level uh, and both complement in terms of equipment, armament, and fuel that you can carry. In terms of numbers, of course, the numbers that the BLWF has is mostly, I presume, vis a vis any foreseen. Uh, expedition they have against the US. But 
still the technical parameters, the difference in Indian Air Force and the Chinese Air Force in terms of numbers, does that pose any major threat? It's like this. Uh, if you remember, we had an exercise called Gagan Shakti sure. a few years back. Uh, that's the beauty of the Air Force. Flexibility. Uh, while during the Gagan Shakti, we did take time. We had to stop because of it was a peacetime exercise. Otherwise, it's a matter of few hours wherein whatever asset is required in whichever side, it can move it. So numbers, uh, what a number of say... 10 aircraft in a low altitude airfield is as good as almost 15 to 20 at high altitude. This is as far as aircraft is concerned. Similarly, every which way, suppose you have a good helicopter which can uh, move troops from one place to the other place or it can use whatever. Uh, those helicopters, if they are available, it's a great uh, strength for the arm, army for focusing on a particular area where the enemy is coming. So that is what is very important, that uh, with newer assets, more capable, we are able to give the right amount of push where it is required. Just to amplify this, uh, while I was the AOCNC, every year we have a meeting of uh, AOCNCs, and this time we also call the SINCAN, Lieutenant General Ajay. Singh was also there and he was also there. We had the Eastern Naval Command, we had the Eastern Army Command, we had a gathering. Each one of us decided, so not only it is on the line of action control, we, have, we talked about how to augment should a situation be developed from the sea also. So these are the things which we are doing, we are working towards it, planning and ensuring that uh, whatever uh, way the enemy thinks, we are able to counter it. On the ground, we've seen skirmishes with the PLA, whether it's in the eastern sector or in Ladakh as well. How does the Air Force deal with um, aircraft, man or otherwise, approaching the LAC? Uh, when uh, the existing LAC, at least in the Eastern Air Command side, there's been no incursions because it's very, very clear uh, to them as well as us. Though they do uh, stake some claim in Arunachal sector, but never have they uh, done aerial incursion. In the Ladakh sector also, uh, one odd incursion may have taken place. So details I will not be able to tell you, but in the eastern sector, there's been no incursion. What? Actually, half as they send their uh, uh, monitoring aircraft, mostly the uh, UAVs at uh, very high altitudes, they follow a particular pattern, they're aware of it, and it's doing well within its uh, uh, borders. So, we also once in a while scrambled just to see that uh, they do not cross. We have our own limits, and uh, uh, we have our places from where we scramble the aircraft. And we send them to just to have a look see. We stay away from each other. There's no question of any skirmish. There's no point in uh, 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 raising the issue when it is not required. In terms of um, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, again talking about the eastern sector, what are our strengths and weaknesses? As far as the ISR is concerned, it's a one of the major. Uh, I won't say shortcoming, but uh, we it's work in progress. We could do with much more than uh, what is uh, available because unless you have sensors, uh, we won't know where to go and what to do. So these sensors, ISR in particular, has to be such that uh, it is real time and we should be able to make use of those ISR to do the correct response. So that's one area which uh, work, in, work in progress and maybe it will take some time. The available number of uh, AVACs is on the lesser side as for the requirement for a two-front situation is concerned. So that is what is uh, needs to be followed up at priority. If I'm not mistaken, sir, you were also a mission commander for the remote uh, piloted aircraft unit as well. Yes. Your assessment of 
again, where we are in terms of unmanned drones, and technology is going so fast, they're talking about, uh, talking about their, their uh, testing hypersonic glide technology as well. Where is India placed in that? India is uh, slightly behind, I won't say slightly, quite behind as far as uh, hypersonic uh, glide bombs are concerned, but uh, be that as it may, whatever they are claiming may not all be as what their claims are. Uh, we need to take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, simultaneously, we cannot not uh, work towards getting our own. We have already started. The idea, the idea is looking, doing something about it. As far as uh, drones are concerned, in a contested airspace, I am very, very uh, sure that uh, things will not be as rosy as it is made out to be that we will send it and drone across and shoot it down. It will be shot down because they every even the smallest of uh, the MK9 Predator class, they have a RCS, they get picked up. But other small drones or swarm drones, the thousands of them, hundreds of them going, it's a question of altitude. Now the altitudes that we are talking about in this area is X of 15,000, 16,000 feet. It doesn't end there. The winds at those altitudes are in excess of 50 to 60, going up to almost uh, 100 uh, knots uh, when the jet stream is there. It has its effects on the drones. So it's nice to talk about it, to be practical. Neither will they be able to use it as much as they would want to, nor will be able to use it. So at the end of it, it's going to be a mixture of everything. So you have to uh, plan it out, Look at the weather, look at the wind conditions, then only we can use. Since you mentioned the MQ over 9B, if they, if and when they do happen, uh, the agreement does happen and we do get them for all price houses, how much of a difference would that? It will make a difference in terms of, uh, because they are armed uh, uh, drones and uh, we will be able to utilize them because uh, access of entry are on the limited side. It's not that entire uh, LAC is available for them to come across or for us to go across. It is those limited areas, this can be utilized which are without that fear of uh, maybe losing a pilot or an aircraft. Uh, these are uh, quite uh, modern uh, drones and uh, they have their own ways of uh, looking after themselves. But uh, that's how uh, I expect them to be of some good use, particularly both for the Army as well as the Air Force. And Amash, how do you assess currently and in the years to come the Indian Air Forces or the Indian military's reach when we're talking about air power uh, when it wants to have eyes and ears all the way from you know the Sunda Straits to the Persian Gulf? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, as far as uh, a lot of talk has uh, happened, particularly when you ask uh, uh, our Navy friends, uh, most of the trade, most of the oil, everything passes to the Indian Ocean. And uh, the sea laws as they are, uh, we should be in a position to cause some kind of blockade to them or whichever way. And for that, you need both uh, blue water navy as well as assets along with that aerial assets which is able to take on should a situation arise wherein you need to take action against enemy shipping. So it's a combined thing which is done by the Air Force and the Navy. We have our Su-30s which have uh, operated, have the capability and the ability. And we have good weapons along with the Su-30s. Like it has come out in the papers, we have the air launched Brahmos taking on ships. So these are the combination of these which will be utilized to enhance the capability. And uh, it's a matter of time where uh, we should actually be getting more aircraft, uh, both uh, capable of doing maritime uh, operations. And at the moment, the Su-30 is there, capable, fairly capable, and fairly accurate weapon uh, that it has got with it. Talking about capabilities, and again, uh, air power, long term, uh, this movement, whether it's uh, with GE or Safran in terms of engine co-development, co-manufacturing, transfer technology, intellectual properties, all that in progress. Even when that does happen, 
uh, for the Indian Air Force or for the Indian military? How much of a game changer will that? It will be a big game changer because anything that you want to get for the country, uh, if we don't produce it, a uh, lot of money goes on. And uh, it's just deterrent money. Uh, one way to look at it is how China has developed its own uh, aircraft systems and uh, missiles, what have you. Over a period of time, they have started honing it and started to claim that they are very good. I cannot guarantee whether they are good, nor can I defy that they are bad. But fact of the matter is, it has happened over a period of time. India also needs to and must uh, follow the same Atma Nirbhar Bharat process, wherein it has to initially, like it is happening, it will be a mix of capability which is bought directly, then it will start with TOT, then it will start with IP, then it's starting. Over a period of time, a few days, yesterday only we sent uh, uh, to the moon and uh, we, ha we are capable, capability is there. But that capability has come after many, many years. Similarly, for uh, air uh, assets or modern assets, it will take time, whether it is the AMCA, whether it is the engine, it will take time. But even those uh, engines have taken 15 years, 20 years to develop. Metallurgy is a case in point wherein uh, it needs IP or at least complete uh, material knowledge for us to make such engines. So it's work in progress and uh, it's a matter of time we should be coming close to that. Talking about time, I am Ashur Patnag again. Thank you so much for spending time with us, sharing both your experience and your expertise with us and all our Strat News Global viewers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for our viewers, do send us your feedback on this interview. You can follow all our social media handles. Do join our Telegram channel. You'll get updates there as soon as we put up articles on our website or interviews like this with Air Marshal D.K. Patnaik on our YouTube channel. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amit Abrevi. If you missed the first two parts of our Eastern Front Air Power series, click on the eye icon on the right of this video or the links in the descriptor.